how do we know ourselves? To a surprising extent, it's just as the way other people know us, by observing our own actions and words and drawing inferences from that. So as we hear ourselves talk, we draw inferences about what our attitudes are. As we witness ourselves acting, we draw conclusions about how we must feel about a subject. What, if anything, has changed about what people perceive money would bring them as far as happiness? I think what the literature says and, and, and your research says that above a certain amount of money, depending on where you live in the world, money doesn't bring any, any much more happiness at all. There's uh, uh, some kind of diminishing returns. That's still- Correct. So yep. above a satiation point, as Daniel Kahneman, our, my Nobel Prize winning colleague has called it, there's diminishing returns. Welcome to The Bounce Podcast. I'm Larry Weeks. Today's podcast is about understanding ourselves a little bit better. And I have a question for you. Do you know what makes you happy? Now, that's a horrible question in the sense that things don't necessarily reach into our brain and turn on the happy button. It's how we interpret things. So I get that. But I mean, generally in your life, if I were to say, Hey, do you know what makes you unhappy? I think, I think we would all quickly identify what, what we don't like or, or what have you. And, and happiness is a complex subject. And I've got things that readily come to mind when, when I ask myself what makes me happy. But, but outside of those few things that come up immediately, it requires some thought. Where I'm going with this is, I, I think all of us have fallen into the trap of doing things, let's say for money, because we think that's going to make us happy and being miserable, making the money that that we thought we were going to, that was going to make us happy. So that's, that's kind of where I'm getting at. And that's where this conversation today goes. We're going to be exploring on the podcast, the insights into psychology of happiness, self-perception, and the various intricate connections between our minds, bodies, social interactions, you name it. And my guest on the show is social psychologist David Myers, known for his extensive work in communicating these this psychological science to both students and general public. His academic contributions, supported by the National Science Foundation, have been published in prestigious journals like Science and The American Psychologist, David has made psychological research very accessible through articles in those magazines and in magazines like Scientific American and through 17 books that would include both general interest and textbooks. In fact, David is best known for his textbook called Psychology, which is one of the most widely used psychology textbooks in the world. And he is also the author of several popular books in the field, including one of the first on happiness called The Pursuit of Happiness, Discovering the Pathway to Fulfillment, Well-Being, and Enduring Personal Joy. This was published back in 1993. Now, his newest book, How Do We Know Ourselves? Curiosities and Marvels of the Human Mind, is kind of the touchstone of this particular show. And a lot of my questions are, are geared toward the content in that book to David. But the conversation is wide ranging when it comes to the field of psychology. When we talk about David's background and and some of his textbooks, we revisit his book on happiness. It was published, like I said, back in the 90s. So we discuss the latest findings in the field, what has proven to be true, what's novel, so on and so forth. And we talk about the relationship between happiness and income. We talk about goal setting and the material trap, why we lean the ladder of success against the wrong wall many times, and we discuss uh, religion, the benefits of religion, and also what he calls the religious engagement paradox. And then we get into more of the concepts in the book around self-perception theory, and he offers up some great insights on how we can better understand ourselves. We talk about mind-body effects. And we have a, a fun discussion about micro friendships, which is very interesting. 
And this is how we can get significant, a significant mood boost from brief positive interactions with strangers. So very interesting. We touch on misplaced fears and we, we discuss fear in general and how we skew risk perceptions. And then we talk about the power of reframing and its effectiveness in brief interventions and a lot of evidence in this, in this area. So very interesting conversation. I thought, I hope you enjoy it. So without further ado, here's David. Hi, David. <laughs> David, Robert, thanks, for, thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. Where do I find you? Where are you today? I'm in my Hope College office at a place called Hope. It's in western Michigan, Holland, Michigan, west Holland, of Grand Michigan. Rapids and up uh, just across the lake from Milwaukee. Again, thank you for coming on. By the way, I was just <clears throat> going through your background and, and some of your books. And I looked at my library. Oh, wow. What yeah. do you know? And a little bit of history. It's marked up. I, I got some questions in here for you, but I, I I thought, I was like, oh, okay. I I think I got this in the late 90s, maybe. But uh, right. I'm wondering if this was one of the first kind of books about happiness generally. Sure. I think it was among books written by psychological scientists about happiness and well being. This was perhaps the first general audience trade book, followed by many others. Yeah, they're all over the place. Yeah. For whom I have great respect. So, but you're a pioneer here, and I, I was going through. Uh, it's marked up, so I got I got some questions about this. Okay, uh, that's I want to specifically want to know what's the latest has been. You know, what do we know, or what have we kept up on that's true that we didn't know, or or no longer true that we thought we knew uh, ab about happiness. Tell me, your CV is very lengthy and uh, you're, you're a very accomplished individual. Tell me what you're doing these days. So my primary vocation, Larry, is still authoring psychology texts, both introductory psychology and social psychology. And so reading all of psychological science and reporting on that. I also have a blog, talkpsych.com, just... Uh, set off for editing a new blog essay uh, this morning on teen depression and how smartphone and social media use contribute to it. And so okay, I have a really cool job. It's just kind That's of a cool l l looking for the most interesting humanly significant information coming out in psychological science and reporting on it. So back to this book, Pursuit of Happiness. You know, as I, as I was perusing, as I told you, by the way, people that are not seeing this, I'm holding up a copy of David's book, The Pursuit of Happiness. I think it was published in 92 or something like that. Correct. I guess, right. Yeah. Just over 30 years ago. Discovering the Pathway to Fulfillment, Well-Being, and Enduring Personal Joy. As I was going through the, the book and my highlights, some of this, a, a lot of this still seems not only relevant, but it's held up. Uh, over the years, I, I so one of you, there's a section here on which within any country are the richest people the happiest, and it talks about money and happiness, and that's a big topic of interest for for many people. And this seems to have held up, and I think you addressed it a little bit in in the new book, by the way, which is good. Since you've written this book, what if anything has changed about what people perceive money would? bring them as far as happiness. I think what the literature says and, and, and your research says that above a certain amount of money, depending on where you live in the world, money doesn't bring any any much more happiness at all. There's uh, some kind of diminishing returns. That's still- Correct. So, so yep. above a satiation point, as Daniel Kahneman, our, my Nobel Prize winning colleague has called it, there's diminishing returns. I won't say there's no increase in happiness with further increase in income. But the curve sort of levels off. By the way, Larry, economists have become very interested in the money happiness question. And so we've seen a lot of recent research from economists. Some of them have argued that, no, there's a continuing linear, linear increase in happiness with increasing log income. Economists like to use logarithmic income. And I won't get into the mathematics of that. But that's not the 
you and I don't go to the store and buy things with log money. We use real absolute dollars. A nerd. Yeah. So what the more recent studies have shown uh, across multiple nations is that when you increase from poverty to being able to afford life's necessities and thus gain more control over your life as well, there is an increase in life satisfaction and self-reported happiness. But as you get above that level, where you have more than enough to afford life's necessities, maybe $80,000 a year for an average American, and you have a sense of control over your life, then further increases in income, the next 40,000, let's say, adds less than did the last 40,000 to your happiness. And so if you think that by getting more and more money, which is what you're driven to do, is you still earn more and more, you're still aspire to more and more, you're gonna become happier and happier, no. You're going to adapt to what you have. It's going to take maybe a higher high to reduce the joy. But it's exactly as you said. There's a kind of leveling off, a diminishing in the increase in happiness with further increases in income and consumption. And all that's relevant to how we can create a sustainable future. Or do we make ourselves happier if we consume more and more? Do we make our children happier if we make them wealthy rather than just secure? Uh, answers are no and no. You mentioned some of the figures, and I think maybe in your books, or I'm conflating everything I've read now about happiness and including your recent work. There was something to do, like with, in poor nations, I think it was 40,000 was kind of the satiation point or, you know, that right. cut off. And then in the Western or, you know, the more wealthier nations, 80 or 90,000 used to be 70 some years right. ago. Now it's risen a little bit. Right. But and of course, that I, depends on where you live, too. Sure, you go to <laughs> if you're in San Jose, California, right? <laughs> you're, you're, Versus North Dakota, yeah, your a shack is going to cost you, you know, two point five million. Is this where we f deceive ourselves? So, am I even aware that my satiation point, unless I'm asked, cuts off at a certain amount? Here's where I'm going. There's something that fights against happiness, and that's comparisons. Right. When right. we compare ourselves, we usually don't compare down. We usually right. compare up. So if we're not aware of, of 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 these stats, does it matter? Because if I start if I'm making 100 grand and I'm comparing myself to someone making 200 grand, I'm unhappy. That right. satiation point didn't hit for me because I have a comparison problem. OK, right. comparison is the thief of joy. Teddy yeah, Roosevelt. it's odious. Somebody would Shakespeare right. say it's comparisons are odious how would i either couple or decouple these two things would i say wait a minute i gotta stop comparing to the higher income look at my own right. life right. and and can i be happy with what i have or am i making myself unhappy with what i don't have well, it's a good yeah. question and i understand it and two thoughts one if you want to feel satisfaction expose yourself to those who have less people who've been volunteers in a burn unit in a hospital have a feeling of gratitude for their own relative health people who've experienced you know abject poverty i have a daughter that works in south africa and is out of the townships sometime when you expose yourself to that you have a sense of your uh, an appreciation of your own blessings you can count your blessings that's one comment the other comment is, do people not appreciate that there's an upper limit to the extent to which increasing income increases happiness? I think they don't. And the evidence, one bit of evidence for that is in the annual UCLA American Council on Education survey called the American Freshman. Every year, UCLA surveys a cross-section of about a quarter million entering collegians in their first week on campus. and. Once again, in the most recent survey, when asked to indicate the importance of different life objectives, the number one rated life objective was becoming very well off financially, which 80% of people entering college rate as very important or essential, more important than raising a family, helping others in difficulty, and other laudable life goals. So. And this is much higher than it was back in the 1960s, which were a less materialistic era than the era in which we now live. So we certainly do have the other the idea, not just that 
earning a stable, secure income, but becoming very well off financially is extremely or very important to life success and satisfaction. That's the belief of today's entering collegians. Wow. So I'm not surprised, but the stories of the very well-off, wealthy, famous, what have you, who who are very unhappy, who've committed suicide, who are addicted to drugs, they're numerous. They're, they're numerous. And, and, right. and we don't we don't learn from those lessons. I yeah. And lottery winners, you know, may they'll be elated for a time, but once they adapt to their new circumstance, it's very hard to sustain that euphoria that comes mm-hmm. with sudden mm-hmm. wealth. I, I, I was trying to think of a heuristic or something to help myself or others as we talk about this who are listening. One of the things that came into my mind is the phrase, is it worth it? Right. Is right. it worth it? So I have a friend, a good friend who's a partner in a law firm, and he he he's got enough money. So he's already, you know, he's been a partner for for many, many years, but <laughs> he's still and he, and he doesn't like his work at all. And for the most part, the unhappiness that leaks out of him or the complaints, it's about work, right? And and it, it's constant. And the pandemic uh shut some things down for a while. And I remember, you know, we were together and he seemed he seemed at peace. He seemed happier. I said, I said, what's what's going on with you? What and he said, I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to an office and we're not doing this crazy stuff right now. Everything is, you know, and, and he goes, I'm, I've given up. It's okay. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't need this. But then, so he was going to retire. So he went to go in. Then they, they threw a lot of money that a case came in. They threw a ton of money at him and said, if you stay. And we had this long discussion. I said, how many hours? He, he said, it's going to be 70 hours. It's going to, you know, blah, 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 blah. And he was. He was hesitant, but he still was kind of hooked by the number. And I said, you don't, we've, I said, we've done the math. You don't need this money. <laughs> I said, what? He said, but, but Larry, if I only do it for six months, you know, I, you know, I'm really don't have to work, you know, <laughs> I don't have to worry, but then I really, really don't. So it, it it's just human nature. I, I, I would probably have the same temptation myself, right? It's just, we, we, we have to ask ourselves, is it worth it? You know, and, and how much is enough? Sure. But of course, your friend, if he made an obscene amount of money, could do other things with it for other people, too. He doesn't have to just consume it on it himself. Yes, true. Is there anything in the happiness field that of late that you find surprising that's that's novel or we didn't know before? Just wanted to. Right, right. Uh, the first thing I'd say is that most of what we understood 30 years ago has held up. OK, so, for example, what really, really matters are are close relationships. We have a deep need to belong and people who enjoy close friendships or a satisfying marriage are much more likely to report themselves very happy and to seem very happy to other people than those who don't enjoy close, mutually supportive relationships. We also have reconfirming evidence time and again that certain traits like a positive self-esteem, an optimistic outlook, a feeling of control over one's life, these tend to be predictive of happiness. Another thing I talked about in the book, I have a chapter, one of the later chapters on, is religious engagement. And here, the more recent research has given us a little more nuanced p- picture. So it continues to be true that people who are actively religious engaged with a faith community are much more likely to say that they're very happy than those who are not religiously engaged. And by the way, that religious engagement does entail a social support network. It's a community of faith that enables people to support one another. So that's that's part of the package, as well as to find meaning and hope and so forth for their lives. But there's a different way of slicing it. That's This is all true if you cut across individuals within, say, the United States or any other country. First of all, it turns out to be, this is especially true within relatively more religious countries like the United States that greater religious engagement is predictive of happiness. Secondly, if you compare religious and irreligious places in the aggregate, like compare Mississippi with Vermont or Alabama with Oregon, you have a relatively religious versus irreligious state, 
Or if you compare a relatively religious country, such as, let's say, Egypt versus Sweden, the less religious country or state tends to be a happier place and to enjoy all kinds of other, I mean, they have higher levels of education, higher income, lower rates of smoking, more longevity. Life is better in less religious states and places, okay? But life is better, and there's less uh, lower arrest rates, lower smoking rate, greater longevity, greater happiness among religious individuals. So I call this the religious engagement paradox. Greater religiosity leads to greater human flourishing across individuals, but to less human flourishing when you compare places in the aggregate. Very interesting paradoxical phenomenon. And so what Ed Diener, one of the now deceased, but the, he was the Jedi master of the world's happiness researchers, and Louis Tay, one of his doctoral students and I did, is an analysis that control for certain other factors like income and education. And when you do that, then the negative correlation between the religiosity of a place and the flourishing of its people goes away. And so that kind of resolves the paradox. So all, all I'm saying, that may mm. sound a little complex to your listeners, but it's kind of, we, we have more nuanced findings here, but the findings still confirm, as does the work by, by the way, Tyler Vanderweel and the Human Flourishing Project at Harvard, that religious engagement across individuals is predictive of human flourishing. It, it seems we are losing that sense of community generally in in, in this country, but this is just my perception that, you know, that that may have been more common in the past, but um, who knows? I, I think that sense is right, Larry, that individualism is greater today than in the past in the United <clears throat> States and greater today in the United States than in other nations as well. And maybe that contributes just this morning. I was reading higher rates of shoplifting and I mean, all kinds of you know, lower rates of charitable contributions today among young Americans than in the past. Uh, so, yeah, no, I, I, I think, I think your intuition is onto something. So, as we as we leave the the happiness topic here, I one more thing is it it's still kind of what's what's the split in our happiness in terms of what we inherit, you know, in our DNA, you know, what our emotional set point is versus what we can do to to increase happiness is it 50 50 is it you know what percent sure so the heritability of human happiness by which we mean variation among individuals is about is close to 50 percent and it's sort of like hmm, your body weight maybe or your cholesterol levels they're genetically influenced But there's also things you can do to tweak or adjust or influence your physiology and your cholesterol level or your smoking or whatever. All these things are biologically and genetically influenced, but they're also subject to willpower and self-control. And so that's why we have some of these wonderful new books, like my colleague Sonia Lubomirsky on The How of Happiness, uh, which is giving guides to, to happiness. And by the way, my own website, davidmyers.org, it's M-Y-E-R-S, davidmyers.org, has a place, if you go to the happiness section, you can click on some evidence-based tips for how to have a more flourishing, happier life. On the on the to-do list of, you know, so I have my set point, to your point, uh, uh, right. to, to what we just discussed. If Is there an 80-20? Is there, is there uh, a domino that 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 helps the other dominoes falls from what you can do to, to be happier? And would that be a relationships? Thing? Yeah, I would say the evidence is strongest for the importance of human connections, of close, supportive, self-disclosing, equitable relationships between people, between you and people you love and who love you. If you have that and not a lot of money, you're happy. If you If you have none of that, and a ton of money, you're likely not happy. Hmm. Yeah, people tend to see, seem to be passive in that area versus work life or other areas where they they, they put a lot of effort in. They seem right. to wait for relationships to come when right. no, 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 that's that you have to plant 
a seed, you, you, th- there's some work that has to be done, right? I, right. Sure. Sure. We can invest in relationships just as your attorney friend does in his job. Yep. Yep. And by the way, I wanted you have some interesting things about micro friendships in, in your new book. So let, let's, now let's move your book. How do we know ourselves? And I, I like to approach you from some, some different angles here, but let's start with the self-perception principle. So this little book, How Do We Know Ourselves, Curiosities and Marvels of the Human Mind, is a collection of 40 essays. And the first is what the book's title is drawn drawn from, How Do We Know Ourselves? And this is a little exposition of what's called self-perception, theory and research on self-perception. How do we know ourselves? To a surprising extent, it's just as the way other people know us, by observing our own actions and words and drawing inferences from that. So as we hear ourselves talk, we draw inferences about what our attitudes are. As we witness ourselves acting, we draw conclusions about how we must feel about a subject. Now, that sounds kind of backwards, but Daryl Bem, who's a researcher, found uh, a lot of evidence to support this. And follow-up science finds that, for example, if you can manipulate people into a facial expression, by saying, like maybe manipulate them into a smile by having them turn up the corners of their mouth as electrodes are attached so they can get a good connection. And then, well, they what, what do you know? They feel happier. They find cartoons funnier. And likewise, if people are coaxed into walking down the hall with their head high and their arms swinging, they feel happier, even though they're not told to be happier, than if they're, than if they shuffle down the hall with their with their head down. So the moral seems to be act as if you're happy and you'll draw inferences from that and you'll feel happier. Mirror others' expressions, by the way, and you can feel what they feel. So bottom line is simply, how do we know ourselves? Partly it's simply by observing ourselves, our words and our actions and drawing inferences from that. So, so this is interesting because I, I think for years I've heard aphorisms or, or things around, you know, hey, it, it, if you're feeling bad, you know, uh, adjust your posture. I, I think the motivational guru Tony Robbins and others are, you know, they, you know, they, they have these admonitions about posture and standing up. And I think there was something a, a TED talk about the power position, even right. you know, things power like posing. this. Right, power posing, and and how these you know, and s- smiling to 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 the example that you gave, but I, I didn't really know any the, the science or the or the studies behind it. So these things have been replicated, David. By the way, I know you have a whole thing on replication as well, but right. but but these things are, in your opinion, fairly proven that yes, you can take some actions with your bodies that that influence attitudes and emotions and what have you. Right. So people who are viewing this can try a little, replicate a little experiment, take a pen or a pencil and put it between their teeth versus between their lips. When you put it between your teeth, you're activating muscles involved in smiling. When you put it between your lips, you're activating muscles involved in scowling or or frowning. I just feel silly right now. (laughs) And some research finds that that affects human emotions. So it's an example of what's called the facial feedback effect. Now, by the way, other research didn't replicate that finding, but more recent research shows that, now it really is a genuine finding, and the studies that didn't replicate it had put a camera on people and made them feel very self-conscious and sort of distorted their emotions. So this is, is there a time? Is by, there? And this is an example, by the way, of where there's question about replication, but it di- really does replicate if done in a more natural context. Yeah. Uh, so, by the way, is there time? It, I mean, is there a certain amount of time? For, oh, yeah. For this smi- is a short-term effect. Right. It's, I mean, so, the, yeah. But, I mean, you a, don't have to do it. So, what I'm saying, it's short-term effect after the fact, but is it also, you don't have to do it for very long to feel oh, some no, effect? Oh, no, it's immediate. Okay. Oh, oh, immediate. Okay. J- Got yeah, it. Just, Got it. just try it. Put that, put that pencil between your teeth yeah. and between your lips, and you'll feel the difference. Okay. Okay. So, this is interesting because you can, it seems, get to your brain through your body. So if you're, David, if you're down or, or what have you, the, you can 
if you if you can't get your your brain to kind of turn around the, the emotional state, you you can influence it via the body. Is that right? Is that right? Can, is that right. a takeaway? Okay. Yeah. Um, and so there's a whole field of research on embodied cognition, as it's called. And so yeah, we uh, think from within a body, right? The brain yeah, networks exactly. uh, that process our sensations communicate with the brain networks. It, it it's all part of the thinking, right? Right. So yeah. if people in some experiments hold a warm cup of tea, they actually feel warmer and express warmer attitudes than, than mm. if they're in a very cold context. And so mm. it's just an example of embodied cognition. Uh, David, there's an interesting, so this may have, was this, I think this was in the nineties as well. Geez, we're, we're doing some time travel here, David, but there's a, there's a program called body for life and some people listening may remember this, but uh, it was a guy named Bill Phillips had this 12 week program and he started this whole challenge. You know, nowadays, the 30 day challenges, 90 day, there, there are all these challenges. All but right. Th th Bill was one of the first kind of, I think, to start this kind of thing, but it was about diet and uh, bodybuilding and uh, body composition, changing your bodies. So he would offer money and some prizes would send in a before and after photo. So the before photo is, you know, you're overweight or whatever it is. And then you would go through this 12 week and then send in a photo after of the changes in your body. And he would offer a, a diet plan. It was a great marketing tool because he was selling supplements and other things. So that aside, I never did it, but I would always, uh, I'd be on the newsletter on the list. So I would look at the winners. I would see all the admonitions. Here's what's interesting. The stories that people report, David, not only did some of these people ch change their body composition, but other things, big changes in their lives happened at the same time. Like they would get a promotion at work or they would do something they never did. They started, they went back to school. There was something to do with the body and the things that they were doing physically to change their body composition that affected, it seems, their whole lives. There was this bleed over effect. A couple of thoughts. One, in experiments on willpower development, people who develop their willpower muscles, so to speak, that can generalize to other areas of their life. Plus, there's some really interesting research that I, I mentioned at the end of the essay on New Year's resolutions that last. By the way, it does help to make a New Year's re resolution. People who state goals are more likely to reach goals than those who don't have goals. Uh, it helps to announce those goals publicly, uh, to develop a strategy for actually implementing them day by day, to monitoring progress and recording that progress, to creating an environment that supports you. If you want to lose weight, getting certain foods out of your cupboards or whatever. But the last thing, and this is the really interesting part, is to make a habit of that new practice that you want. And the question is, how long do you have to do it before it becomes an automatic thing you would need to do if you want to exercise more, for example. How long, how many days in a row do you have to force yourself to exercise before you no longer have to force yourself? You want to do it. And if you don't do it, you feel like a slug. By the way, when we finish our conversation here, I'm going to be heading over to my college gym. It's just something I have to do. My day won't feel right if I haven't done it. Yeah. Well, the answer is on average, from research done in the UK, it's about, it depends on what it is you're trying to change, but about 66 days. So if you're, if our listeners want to change themselves in some significant way, form some healthy new habit, it takes effort. It takes self-discipline. I know it's hard. It's not easy, but do it for two months every day. And it'll start to become part of your life and just automatic. Yeah, for for those contemplating learning something, so one ways to 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 we we talk about something generalizing to other areas of your life, taking a course, learning a new skill, these things in and of themselves are beneficial. It seems they also have these downstream effects elsewhere right. in your life. So it's learn a new skill, go out there, learn how to dance, do something. I remember taking up martial arts when I was very very young, and it was so new and so novel. It wasn't just that I enjoyed it, but it 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 expanded my world. To me, these things that we're talking about it are are world expanding and experience expanding that are that have benefits across your life. That's the end of my sermon. 
I think in the book you allude to or actually are explicit with, can we periodically check in with our actions and behaviors for a better self-understanding that if we look at our behaviors as if we're looking at someone else, can we discern who we are and what we like from that? That's the whole premise of self-perception theory, that we know ourselves exactly as you just described, Larry. So, yes. But you need a high-level self-awareness, right? I yeah. need to. But, but okay. you know, often we do that naturally. We see how we've reacted in a particular social situation. Maybe we we found ourselves getting angry, and we, then we afterwards say, whoa, you know, that really that really yeah. mattered to me. I need to tune in right. and go, oh, well, okay, this is saying something about me. Right. What is it, right? Right. What did and I learn about myself from this interaction, there or this go. experience, or the way I reacted? Right. I'm going to be a field journalist on 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 myself. Right. right. Exactly. Hey, how did I behave in the wild? Oh, right. You, what does that mean? Okay. All right. Thank you. Tell me about the avail availability heuristic and how it plays a role in in how we fear, and then how it shapes our perception of events around us. Right. The availability heuristic. By the way, heuristics are kind of cognitive rules of thumb, so to speak. They're just kind of automatic ways of thinking. And Daniel Kahneman, whom I referred to earlier, the great Nobel Prize winning psychologist for creating behavioral economics, introduced us to research on the availability heuristic, which is the tendency to judge the frequency of events, not in terms of their statistical frequency, but how readily available they are in memory. So as we're having this conversation, a mass shooting has just occurred in the state of Maine. And people in the United States have already expressed fears of being the victim of a mass shooting. And surely those fears will be enhanced by the massive publicity of the 18 people killed in a mass shooting in Maine. Are our fears in accord with our actual risk of being the victim of mass shooting? There are like 332 million Americans, about 100 are killed each day with guns, by the way, of which earlier this week, 18 were killed in a mass shooting. So that's just a few hours in an average day. The answer is no, uh, the availability heuristic can lead us greatly astray. My favorite example of this is people's fears of flying versus driving. In recent National Safety Council data, we are mile per mile about 500 times safer on a commercial airliner than we are in a vehicle on the road. After 9-11, Americans stopped flying because they had these readily available images of airplane crashes and terrorist acts. And so we feared flying because that was what was cognitively available in mind. We don't think statistically. We think in terms of, of readily available images of vivid happenings. And I calculated that if in the next year, as a result of those fears, Americans who were flying 20% fewer miles drove half those unflown miles, because up here in Michigan, we were going to drive to spring vacation down with you in Florida, Larry, rather than flying, then we could project, given the greater risk of driving, that the terrorists would kill an additional 800 Americans on America's highways during that next year. A German researcher did what I should have thought to do, but was foolishly didn't even think to do, and that is a couple of years later, check out that prediction. And it turned out I had the right idea, but I underestimated. The terrorists actually killed an additional 1,500 excess deaths on American highways because of excess driving rather than flying. And so this is just one example of how the availability heuristic leads us to fear the wrong things very often. That is to fear what there are dramatic instances of, what's vividly in the news, rather than what really puts us at risk. And so we fear for swimming off your Florida waters. We fear shark bites because we can have, having seen jaws, readily available images in our mind of being bitten by a shark, even though the likelihood of that happening is probably less than the likelihood of dying driving to the beach. So based on that concept, if in fact the news reported traffic deaths and accidents as as they do other fairly, you know, a, a plane going down 
is so rare that it's big news, right? Correct. But so we yeah, in, in a sense, it's been said if it's if it leads the news tonight, it's something that hardly ever happens. That, that's a great way to that's a great way to put it. So, but you know, if it's interesting, so, I, I I don't fear flying. But what's interesting is I'm on the road. I'm I'm probably more tuned into it now. How risky driving is, you know, and this seems to have been exasperated since the pandemic. But it could be just some perception in my mind. But man, traffic is crazy. People are driving crazy, and I have near misses quite frequently that right. I s- fairly soon dismiss out of mind. Right, like like cars just just barely almost hitting me or I almost hitting them, whatever. And it happens frequently, but I it, it, then it kind of dissipates. There's something I'm getting used to that's, sure. that's sure. odd. Right? Whereas if you think statistically, which is thinking in terms of reality, then say for me, the scariest part of my flying to Florida from Michigan is the drive to the Grand Rapids airport. Once I'm in the loving care of Delta Airlines, I can relax. And I actually do because I believe the numbers. I never think I'll ever hear that term again, the loving care of Delta Airlines. <laughs> <laughs> they need to hire you. Now, let's talk about micro connections. This is fascinating to me. Right. These are casual chats. These are fleeting interactions, right? Right. I'm just meeting somebody saying hi and what have you. So this is inspired by research by my social psychologist colleague, Nick Epley, Nicholas Epley at the University of Chicago. And he and others find that micro, what I call micro friendships, fleeting positive interactions with people can brighten both our days and their days. And so what he, for example, in one of his experiments in Chicago did was ask some people, but not others, as they entered into their morning commute into the city to chat up their the person on the subway next to them or on the elevated train next to them. And those who did so, as opposed to others, were, when they finished that ride, feeling happier, and so were their conversation partners. And others have done this sort of research with people who are entering a coffee shop, engaging some of them, but are randomly assigned not others, in chatting up the barista, after which they feel happier if they've engaged in this micro-interaction or greeting a bus driver in Turkey versus not greeting the bus driver and smiling at the bus driver. And so what this research suggests is that these small acts of kindness leave both the giver and the recipient feeling better afterwards. And the practical lesson that we can apply to our own lives is take a little initiative, chat up the grocery store clerk, reach out to lost friends, talk to the to the to, to, to the server, don't just ignore the server, have a, a little brief exchange. And because we're social animals, as Aristotle said, if we'll push that our comfort zone, maybe talk to the ride share driver a little bit rather than just stay silent in the back, you'll brighten their day and you'll brighten your own. And that's the happy science of micro friendships. What I love about this, first, is I do this, uh, but it wasn't, I wasn't trying to make myself happier. I don't know what drives me. My wife gets it concerns her occasionally, but I talk to strangers all the time and I, I try to make a connection. I don't know why, but. And Larry, Larry, maybe you do that partly because you're a natural extra, extrovert. You're naturally outgoing. You're interested in people. That's why you host a successful podcast and enjoy doing so. What the research found is that even introverts who force themselves to have these brief micro interactions with others whom they encountered in their daily lives were happier after pushing their zone of comfort to do so. That's what I love about this is this is an easy thing because you're interacting with people out of necessity at the mail room or at the UPS store or at the grocery store or at the restaurant. These are little opportunities for little pieces of happiness that you can accumulate during the day. These are opportunities, right? Right. Exactly. Now, it, it is challenging if you're an introvert to to kind of push that, but but it's According to what you're telling me, it's it's well worth it. You can, I one of the benefits that I've also encountered is that you know, especially if you go to a similar restaurant, you know, on a, on a monthly basis or weekly, but whatever it is, you you now you're they're not only micro; they are now genuine friendships. That right. if the same people work there, they know you. You know, it's like the it's like the Cheers bar, no arm. You know, exactly. They know exactly. you. 
So it's when, cool. When I, you're when not, I go to my local coffee, sh- coffee shop, Cheryl, who's the proprietor, who's the proprietor, greets me with a hug and how are you doing? And you know, yeah. And, yeah. Now, what I didn't know, and I thank you for for sharing that, is that I didn't know how it affected them, right? I didn't right. know, but you're saying it benefits both if there's a positive. Absolutely. Connection. Okay. Absolutely. So that's a good thought. That that right. makes me feel good, right? Yeah. Um, so, by the way, that was one of my favorite essays in this little book on the curiosities and marvels of the human mind. It's really I'm great. Glad you like that too. I love it. Well, because obviously it it validates something I've I've been doing in in a way. It was in Daytona. There was some kind of parade. We were with some friends, and they were taking us to this parade. So everybody's lined up on the streets, and I don't know why I did this, but I go. And there, I think there was no chairs to sit down and there was a guy sitting down. I said, I walked up to this guy, I said, Hey, can I just use your lap? He said, sure. You know, joking. I sat down on his lap, you know, and <laughs> everybody got a laugh, you know, and I'm like, I'm embarrassing my wife again, but, but we struck up a conversation and he said, my gosh, you, you look like a, a friend of mine. I just lost like earlier in the year. Oh, wow. And we had this whole conversation and it wasn't a sad moment for him it was a good moment because he he was reminded of his friend he p- pulled out a picture showed me his friend and we did look alike and anyway that's just an encouragement and, and, for all and the your, your, the encounter you just reported larry reminds me of some of the stories i tell at the end of this essay because i invited facebook friends to contribute examples for their own life where they chatted up somebody and it turned out to be really significant and and the the stories are just heart rendering yeah yeah this was yeah, you know, this was one one such story. So I, I really like that. He, he, I don't think I've ever encountered or blindsight or understood blindsight. This is fascinating to me. Could you tell me what blindsight is, or for our audience here? It is indeed a fascinating phenomenon. First, first of all, the phenomenon is that some people who are consciously blind have another visual system that's outside their awareness that enables them to navigate the world. And so with these brain injured blind sight people who can't see a chair in the hall in front of them, as they walk down the hall, they will navigate around that chair. Or if given an envelope to put into a mail slot that is at differing angles, they will deny that they're able to do it because they can't see it. But if asked to guess, they can reliably put the envelope through the slot. And so, as David Milner at University of St. Andrews has said, is one of the researchers of this study, and one of the one of these patients who happened to live in St. Andrews, Scotland, it's as if there's a zombie within, to use his words. And this is illustrative of a larger human phenomenon, which is what we call implicit cognition. Our conscious awareness drives, I mean, we're consciously aware of our attitudes, our memories, our prejudices, and so forth. But there's another level of human thought that is implicit. It's automatic. It's out of sight. It's not Freud's unconscious, which was seething with aggression and sexuality. This is just automatic information processing in the form of implicit memories that people who are brain damaged and cannot form new memories may not realize what they've learned. And so you can teach these people a new skill, like how to solve a block stacking puzzle. And then you present them with a puzzle and they'll say, I don't know how to do this. And you tell them, well, try. And they'll solve it like a practice expert because they're not aware of what they know. It's an implicit memory. And likewise, we have implicit as well as explicit attitudes. That is kind of implicit attitudes would be kind of our automatic instant reactions to certain situations or people even without our consciously our conscious awareness of, of, of those attitudes or what's driving them. So blind sight is vision without awareness, if you will, or it's visual processing without awareness. And it's an example of a larger phenomenon of, of what we call dual processing. We have a two-track mind, a two-track brain. It's partly explicit and conscious, but there's a very large implicit unconscious level of information processing. And it's one of the big lessons of the last 25 years of psychological science. Is blind. So this, this lends me to want to ask you about intuition, you know, is intuition in this body brain kind of 
intelligence system. It is, uh, there's a, so Malcolm Gladwell wrote a book called Blink, and I think he mentioned a, a phenomenon oh, called Thin. It, yeah, thin by Malcolm Gladwell. Yeah. And he, he, he wrote about a phenomenon called thin slicing. And one of the things he, uh, stories he mentioned was somebody, a coach was watching a tennis match. He was there with him and the coach was watching these, these professionals play the, the match. And when a, a certain person was serving, he would say, uh oh, and then they would default. He would know he, he, he could pick up when they were about to, 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 right. to, to default to serve. He, he could pick up something when. When the server is going to go off that no one else could detect malcolm called this thin slicing and i think that the gist of his point was that there's so much information that this coach has took and has taken in and learned and taught over the years that there's certain things outside of his conscious mind that unconsciously he could just kind of sense that okay that something is off a form of intuition if you will so my question to you is what is intuition and is it you know, involved in this brain body kind of intelligence. Right. So your question is a great one because blind sight is an example of human intuition of kind of automatic knowledge of the world around us. And the research on thin slices that Malcolm Gladwell builds on in his book on, on intuition is a great example. And other examples of that would be people's reading others' emotions almost instantly. Students, for example, exposed to just a 10 second video of somebody's teaching a class can make a reasonably accurate guess of that professor's end of the semester student evaluations. Because there are certain things about you, your warmth, your energy and so forth, and your voice that come through immediately. You pick it up in very thin slices. Or think also of domains of where you have expertise. Intuition is often, the great psychologist and also Nobel Prize winner Herbert Simon said, experience that forms into kind of automatic expertise. And so a chess master can just look at a board and know what this next move is. Or an experienced medical diagnostician can see a patient walk in the office and kind of immediately recognize an issue there just as the tennis expert can take one look at somebody in the process of serving and make a judgment. I have a book actually, Larry, it's entitled Intuition, Its Powers and Perils. And so mm. part of the book is on these powers of intuition, of automatic information processing. The other part is on the perils of thinking that we have correct intuition when we really don't, as we discussed earlier, fearing the wrong things, thinking we're at, in more danger on a plane than we are in a car, or that mass shooters are a greater risk to us than a lot of other things that are that are actually real risks to us, or thinking that we can outguess the efficient marketplace by our in, intuition about what's going to happen. Yeah, or I have a, I have a uh, feeling it's going to go up, or I have a feeling yeah, something's Or good. thinking that, that we can detect lies that other people are telling when that's a, actually a very difficult thing to do. Or interviewers for an, for an employer thinking that they can judge a future employee's success in the job from a brief subjective conversational interview when in fact their in intuitions turn out to be much poorer predictors than other predictors of job performance. So there are powers and there are perils to human intuition. And part of what our science has done is identify what each are. So without, that's a great question. Without going into a whole lot of detail here, because I'm I'm aware of the time, but well, give me the demarcation. Tell me at a high level, when to use how to use intuition and and let me let me tee it up for you because i just had this conversation with a guy named shane Parrish about intuition and, and he made the point of if you have experience in a domain a lot of it you've accumulated your intuition is you should probably tune into that in that area outside of that uh where you don't have much experience at all that kind of builds up this intelligence that you can automatically draw from that, that runs in the background. You should probably double check and not just go with your with your gut there. Larry, I couldn't stay in any better than you just have. And then yes. just <laughs> uh, add to that. I mean, in the first case, I think of Pascal, the heart has its reasons. The reason doesn't know. When you have acquired expertise, listen to your heart because it's telling you something. Mm -hmm. But Solomon said, he that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. There's other areas where 
we don't have a lot of experience, and we overestimate our own expertise. David Dunning, a colleague of mine at University of Michigan, created what came to be known as the the Dunning-Kruger effect, which is the tendency Mm. for incompetent people to overestimate their own competence. I was just in correspondence with him this week about an incident that happened some years ago where bank robbers in Pittsburgh painted their face with lemon juice, which they thought made them invisible to the cameras. <laughs> and, and But it didn't, so they were soon apprehended. But it was a case where their own incompetence <laughs> led them to behave well, hang on a second. And, and because they, they didn't appreciate their incompetence. <laughs> so part of wisdom is knowing the limits of your own knowledge. David, you can't just throw that story out without. So there's a group, not just one. There was a group of people that thought if they put lemon juice on their faces or there were whatever. Two, there were two bank robbers there were in, two. in Pittsburgh in 1975. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. They, they, wow. They'd read this and they and they had tested out it on something and there must have been a defect and it didn't work. So <laughs> The mirror was broken or so. No, that's, that's crazy. <laughs> okay. This has been great, David. And I want to end here with reframing because it, it, in your book, you were talking about interventions, I think, about how you can help teenagers or high, you know, certain class of people at certain parts of the lives and, and where a lot of money and resources was spent in some cases to, to, to prevent, you know, kids from turning out bad or, you know, whatever the situation right. circumstance was. But what really, it, it, all of that was random. It, it, you know, it was 50 50 whether any of that money right. and time spent would work. I'm oversimplifying it, but, what did work was reframing an experience at the moment that experience happened. Right. So on the one hand, there's a lot of well-intentioned efforts in which a lot of money and time is that have been invested to prevent juvenile delinquents from a life of future crime or to, I mean, it's it just... It, which have been found actually sadly yeah. to be... And I'm going to totally point people in- to the book. Yeah, there's, they yeah. should look at the research there. Totally ineffective. But surprisingly, there have been some what are called wise interventions, brief evidence-based interventions at key times in people's lives, like middle school students that are at risk or entering minority college students or new new moms who are helped to at key times in their lives when the twig is being bent to to have a different way of interpreting life events, to achieve more of what Angela Duckworth is called a growth mindset, to think that their efforts can, like a muscle, make them grow stronger and being able to cope with life's events. And as, as they're led to kind of just interpret their experience differently through these brief interventions, students have gotten better grades, new parents have understood their children better and been less abusive to them. There have been a number of good consequences. I will say that this research, more than any other I report in this book, kind of challenges my own, you know, thinking like, really? These brief interventions can have enduring effects? So I want to see more replications, but there have been enough replications that I have to give this some credence. But the brief interventions were reframes. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Some of the, it's helping you reframe or reinterpret experiences that you're having. So something, somebody, uh, I'm going to make this up, but let's say somebody fails a test or bombs on stage or whatever, right? Right. Young, impressionable, or they're doing something for the first time. At the moment or soon after around there, somebody uh, coming to that person and and reframing that experience, helping them reframe it, is, is were some of the kind of the interventions, correct? They would reframe that sure. experience so that they could take something positive or learn from it versus let it defeat sure. them. Yeah. Sure. So we social psychologists talk a lot about attributions. That is how to what do people attribute their experiences? And so if you have a bad experience and you attribute it internally, the problem is mine. I don't mm-hmm. have the I don't have the competence. I don't have the the energy or whatever to succeed. It's always going to be this way. It's never going to get better. And you have a different outlook than if you have an external attribution or explanation of the events. I had a bad day. 
it was a, a super hard exam. Uh, I didn't study hard enough, but I could s- certainly study harder on the next one. And so, yeah, it's how you frame it, how you interpret it to what you attribute your experience. That's part of this. But but there are various uh, wise, brief interventions that have been attempted. And I give some examples of in the essay. And Yeah, that's great. Uh, I had a friend of mine who was scammed with some kind of timeshare thing, what have you. And she just felt stupid, right? Like, right. This, you know, and I said, I said, look, I want you to imagine a gym, nasium, uh, 2000 people fill that gymnasium. That's how many or more right now are being scammed in this right. kind of thing. This is a scam that it, it's, it's meant to fool people. You are not alone. This is not you failing. You know, this right. is just you're a victim. Right. Right. And that, that reframe seemed to help. So, Dave, this has been fantastic. How do people find you? Is it your website? Yeah. Uh, and DavidMyers.org. Yeah. Just got to spell okay. Myers correctly. M-Y-E-R-S. DavidMyers.org. Be happy to and, hear from anybody. And, and they, can, they can read a lot of free material and and see a link to this new book of essays that I so enjoyed writing. Sort of a buffet of hors d'oeuvres of psychological science. Little short essays that could be read in five minutes by the bedside. Yeah, it's great. I, I love that format, uh, the, the essays. I don't know why this came to mind, but are, are profile, personality profile tests valid at all? It, are any of them? It depends what test we're talking about. So, some, For some, there's a great deal of supportive evidence. For others, such as... There's the nothing same, for Myers-Briggs. The Myers-Briggs, that's, if, that's I dare, a, if I dare say. That's no a made up, to, right. There's not a lot of supporting evidence. Yeah. Okay. David, thank you so much for coming on. This is I really enjoyed it. I appreciate talking. I enjoyed it too, Larry. And I'm uh, so delighted that you welcomed me to be your guest today. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thanks again. I'm, I'm honored by your attention and thank you for your interest. And have right. a good day. You too. Hey, Take okay. care. Bye bye. Bye bye. Well, that's a wrap. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed it, do share it with your friends and on your social platforms. Big thanks to Sam Williams, my audio guy, and the beautiful bumper music you're hearing is Michael Petrovich's Bella Luna. For all my show notes or resource links, visit LarryWeeks.com, and we will talk again soon. Mm-hmm.